if humans are happy, then the employees are happy. And as we say in our book, coaching athletes to be their best, it's human first, athlete second. And so it's really human first, manager second, human first, leader second. For over 20 years, Dr. Jonathan Faders used performance coaching to help pro athletes, firefighters, and everyday folks be better at uh, anything. Equipped with a PhD in clinical psychology and a lifelong passion for helping others, Faders dedicated himself to elevating human potential. He's counseled multiple sports teams, ranging from the New York Giants to the New York Mets. He's an author, a coach, a speaker, and he uses motivational interviewing, performance training, in cognitive behavioral therapy to unlock the psychology of success. He's been profiled a bunch, including in the New York Times, and he wrote a best-selling book that I picked up, and that's why we reached out to Jonathan to have him on the podcast. His book, Life as Sport, What Top Athletes Can Teach You About How to Win in Life, is a must-read for all of you people leaders who are most concerned with how to get the most out of the work you do every day with your people. His book is based on thousands of hours of conversations he's had with athletes from various sports. That's power forwards, tennis phenoms, power hitting outfielders, and battle scarred linebackers, as well as hedge fund managers, entrepreneurs, A-list actors, and dozens of other elite achievers in sports business and performing arts. Again, it's a must read. I want to catch up with Jonathan and talk to him about the future of work. What can organizations do to get the most out of what they put in to their workforce? Let's bring it in. Why, why did you write that book at the, in kind of this, this moment? Well, I think, you know, the first thing I would say, Sam, is how it happened. Um, I had written a, a previous book called Coaching, uh, called uh, Life as Sport. And Life as Sport is all about how you can take the techniques of, of sport and perf- performance psychology and apply them to other areas in life. I found that working with athletes, I, I had realized that all the things we do with athletes to help them be at their best mentally, like self-talk, meditation and mindfulness, imagery, um, gratitude, uh, developing an excellent mental performance routine, um, that those things were really applicable to uh, the work I was doing coaching executives and coaching people uh, in other areas of life, in parenting, in everything. And you know, when I look back on my training, I had a lot of training in this technique called motivational interviewing. And you know, I reached out to, the, to someone I knew not at that point knew as a, as a colleague, but uh, who had f- came up with this idea of motivational interviewing, Steve Rolnick. And he said, well, you know, that's really interesting. I've always wanted to take this technique of motivational interviewing into sports. And so we began to really think about what is this longstanding, scientifically validated way of communicating that's been around in research, in medicine, that's been around in um, in other areas of, of, of life. What, what does that look like? What does motivational interviewing, this, this evidence-based technique, look like uh, in sport and performance? How would you define motivational interviewing for people who don't know? So motivational interviewing, I would define it as a, a strategy, a way of being in communicating with other people to help people um, resolve their ambivalence about change. It's an evidence-based way of connecting with people and um, improving your own ability to A, empathize um, with them, to get to be a better communicator about empathy, but also to help people refine and articulate their personal motivators, what we say these days, their why for change. It's a, it's a method for honing in on what makes people tick and help them articulate their own motivations uh, that usually lead to a better performance outcome. When I, when I first picked up the book and I read it, it was one of those books that, now I can read pretty fast, Jonathan, but this was a, this, you had to wrestle with this book in a good way. Uh, and I felt, I felt at times as I was going through it, almost like everything I knew about the English language, <laughs> I don't know how to express, but I feel like the my I I lost the ability to speak as a manager in some moment moments because I was really trying to think about how to apply it. And it's it's tough stuff. 
I think it's one of those things where, you know, it's, it's really tough in the sense of when you first start to think like this, it's kind of like, you know, you know, driving a stick shift car, right? You're used to going on automatic and then all of a sudden you like, oh, I'm driving stick now. I really have to think about things, but it becomes natural. And, and I would say that to, the real simplified way to think about this is typically we, we, there's two ways to listen to people, Sam. We can listen for the purpose of replying or we can listen to really understand them. And the biggest shift in motivational interviewing is getting better at listening to people to understand them. And that's a big shift, right? To change your, your kind of mindset as you're listening to your employee, as you're listening to the person on your team. We typically listen and we're thinking, okay, now this is what I'll tell them or how I'll respond to what they're saying. Rather than deeply understanding, okay, this is what's going on for this person. This is what they're trying to tell me. And so I think, yeah, there's, there's a lot of techniques and um, you know, shifts, and as you said, complex ways to use language, but it's very basic level. You know, it's really being getting better at a deep understanding and a deep listening, which is really challenging. You know, we, we really, we have very little practice at that. We're much more practiced at just sharing our knowledge and, um, you know, responding, refuting, uh, trying to persuade people. Has it gotten harder over the last decade or so? Has it got, is it getting harder to teach motivational interviewing given how connected people are and you know multitasking is something that is attempted by many on an ongoing basis people are on zoom but they're doing nine different things at the same time is it is is it getting harder to to teach this to managers and leaders uh i think that you know technology um makes it more difficult um and there's much more distractions. Um, but I, I think the biggest distraction is the one that's that's within us. The best, biggest distraction is that we don't practice, you know, our ability to recognize that we that we have a certain desire for people to change. So I think that I think that um one of the things that we talk about in the book is this idea of uh, that everybody has a writing reflex, that we have this desire to write what's wrong. So, you know, humans have a negative bias. And when we're looking with someone on our team, someone on our employees, we're always going to see what they're doing wrong. Right. Um, and when I look at, at, at performance reviews of, of CEOs I coach or, um, or of, of a athlete, I, I, you know, it's very much based on, it's a weakness profile. It's based on like, what's wrong with the person. Our minds work evolutionarily to notice what's wrong. And so I would say, yes, technology is, is a barrier or an obstacle, but I think Sam, the biggest obstacle is our own tendency to want to correct. You know, we all know this, if you're a parent, you know, this, like, it's much easier to see what our kids are doing that isn't right than what our kids is do, are doing that is right. And so I think that's the biggest um, challenge to really being in an in a effective communication style with people on our team is to, to see them in their best light. Now, that's not to say that you're not going to you're not going to point out or give feedback to things that aren't working well, but just to, starting from the standpoint of saying, all right. I'm going to think about what I can, you know, what, it, what is going on that's working well here, I think is a profound shift in the communication style that, that excellent coaches and excellent leaders really do more often. You know, today it said that the average, uh, we're on to Gen Alpha now. So it sounds, like, it sounds like we're going to like a new planet, you know, starting yeah. all over again. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so uh, as a millennial, I'm happy because we're totally done complaining about my generation and Gen Z is sort of in the crosshairs, but Gen Alpha, they say, could carry up ends of 36 jobs in a lifetime. Obviously a lot different than maybe our parents. My mom had you know, two jobs in a lifetime. So my, my question to you is, as people in work are going to have to be great learners of new skills and this aspect of upskilling and reskilling and upskilling and reskilling, which it's not that different than athletes that, you know, in, in, in a sports world, constantly developing and, and getting better. But 
in the workforce, as workers are continuously learning new skills and upskilling and reskilling and moving so quickly, you know, I think about in the book, you talk about the aspect of uh, giving feedback and coaches and managers that are responsible for that aspect of feedback to uh, help people understand um, where they're at, where they can go. I guess, how do you, what do you, what do you think about when you think about workforce development and especially in your travels working in CEOs, where, where do you feel um, even maybe beyond, beyond giving feedback, motivational interviewing can play the biggest role in helping organizations build high performing workforces. Well, I think you hit it. I mean, I think one of the biggest areas is what we call feedback. Um, however, I think that feedback uh, has lost its true purpose and meaning. I mean, even, it's funny when you think about the word feedback, um, I speak Spanish. And so in, in Spanish, the word for feedback is retroalimentación, which if you think about it, it's like actually giving people back nourishment. And if you think about feedback, right, it's like you're giving people food back, right? Now, when, when, but if I say feedback, if I'm like, hey, I'm going to give you some feedback, what the person hears in our world is I'm about to criticize you. I'm about to tell you what you're not doing well. I'm about to tell you all your flaws. So just brace for this because this is going to be a really humbling and terrible experience. And so what MI does to that conversation, I think it brings it back to its true meaning. If you're, if you're really giving good feedback, you're helping someone to realize the areas of strength they have and the missed opportunities that if they just shifted in a particular way. And so motivational interviewing, I think, is, is, is a way to get back to true feedback. In my view, the best kind of feedback is, you know, that is feedback in which you, sh the, you help the person to show themselves what they need to do to change. Right. And, and the science supports me here. You know, if, if I say to you, hey, Sam, you know what? I think you should change the podcast in, in this kind of way. You should have me on every week. You're going to say this guy he doesn't know what he's talking about. But if 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 I get from you what you need to do uh, to change your podcast to make it the best podcast ever, then that's much more powerful. And so in the book, as you know, um, we, we, we talk about it in three different styles. Most managers, most coaches they rely on one style, which we call fixing. Fixing is explaining to people what they need to do. And so in traditional feedback, we say, hey, I just want to point out this and that other thing. That's fine. But that there are two other very powerful styles of communicating uh, that coaches and CEOs can use. One is called following, which is deep, profound listening, which is a skill that in my experience coaching, even the best, you know, most uh, formidable and powerful CEOs, people really, People really lack um, some core skills there, the ability to listen actively, to reflect back what you're saying. And then, you know, the other one that's really central and to the point of feedback is, is called guiding, right? So asking people powerful questions, right? Um, so when you retire, when you hang it up, what, what, what do you want to be remembered for? Um, you know, I'm curious, what, what do you see are areas that, you know, you feel you can perform. If we asked your team, what would your team say? What's at stake for you if you don't make a change in this part of your How do you see things going if you were to continue kind of making the choices you are or if you changed? You know, that, that learning ways of guiding people in these conversations and practicing this guiding style is profound uh, in feedback. Because as I was saying, my experience is that the best powerful feedback is when someone names for themselves out loud what they need to do in order to change rather than have someone else name it for them. You, you brought up science a few minutes ago. I'm interested in, I'm sure you have conversations with coaches and athletes and skeptics, CEOs. What, what do you reference when you're trying to communicate that MI works and that this approach is effective and should be adopted and you should put as much work behind it as you need to. Yeah, I mean, I think the the there are definitely, as you said, skeptics out there. Um, the, the famous psychologist Abraham Maslow said, you know, if the only tool you have is a hammer, then everything looks like a nail. And, you know, I think many of us are just so used to 
one style of doing things that, you know, it, it seems to work because it's just the only thing we know how to do. I, I'd say the most powerful data or science behind this is the data that shows, Sam, that um, the single biggest predictor of whether people change is how much they talk about reasons or needs for change rather than if their coach or therapist or, you know, in this case, their, their, their boss or their supervisor tells them to change. So just the simple fact of knowing that, that the biggest predictor of change is the amount of words spoken by the person in favor of change. So I think that, that whatever technique you use, that as the kind of, you know, real true north of the conversation is pretty powerful. My role is to help this person articulate, say out loud to me, the reasons that they, they should change and, and how. The other thing I think about this is like what I say to people all the time who are skeptics is like, what's the alternative? <laughs> like, you know, I mean, if you're trying, if you're telling someone they can't, that this is what they need to do and they're not doing it, it's, it's clear that another approach is warranted. I looked at this immediately as a framework that organizations could use when they develop managers as they think about how they, you know, we used a restaurant example. Uh, you know, if you are taking a server who is your best server and you are promoting them into a role where they're responsible for more, maybe they're managing the, your, your location or a store, arming them with a, with a framework or a toolkit that they can operate from in order to, you know, again, motivate, set goals, give feedback. That was what was running through my mind as I, as I, as I read the book. I mean, is that fair? Is that fair? Is that, do you feel like this works really well in a workforce setting? Because obviously the book talks about sports and, and, and athletes as like the central focus. Yeah, I, I absolutely do. In fact, I think that's like the, the, the idyllic future world, right? Is a world where, you know, everybody gets training on this. And, and while this book was written for sports, uh, I have to say that, you know, in my own professional career as, as a executive coach and a coach of a performance coach, um, this is something that I train um, many leaders on um, are the core skills in motivational interviewing. Because the core skills in motivational interviewing, I often say that, that empathy is the price of admission to a conversation. Whatever, you know, whatever you're trying to convey, whatever you're trying to, to, whatever change you're trying to make, people are just going to be more tuned in if they really feel that you understand them and their perspective. And all the research on, on leadership says there's kind of two kinds of leaders, transactional leaders and transformational leaders, right? And so a transactional leader is one that's just like, this is what has to get done. This is your job. And, you know, as you know, a transformational leader is one that actually knows who he's talking to or she's talking to they know okay these are the people this is the person i know sam and i know what sam's doing one of the things i like about the one huddle website is you know if you if you scroll over everybody on one huddle in terms of their profile it shows like a personal side to them right so you know some people have like a baseball bat some people have a you know a, a new york giants a football Th those people we know are, are the best employees just saying um and uh and so you know it, it's a level of as a leader being able to know like this is who these people are right and at the end of the day everybody just wants to be um part of something they want to belong and everybody wants to feel that they are you know um manifesting their their highest ability they want to make an impact and in a workforce those are the two things that as a leader we have to address so you know, getting back to this idea of transformational leadership, what motivational interviewing does is it gives you a method, it gives you a roadmap to be a better transformational leader. You could just say, I want to be a transformational leader, or you could say, well, what are the skills that are going to help me? And certainly listening really well, asking great questions, empathizing are really the hallmarks of being a great leader. So yeah, I would agree. I think this is something for that restaurant manager. It's something for you and me leading teams. It's something for um, anyone who's interacting in a workplace we're, you know, as in every team, you know, knowing, knowing the people, not just knowing the process is essential. It's, it's all great resignation, quiet quitting. I don't know what the next one's going to be. Boss loss was one. Um, you know, the other thing I'm interested in your, I don't know if you get this question at all, but since you know, so much of the conversation and, uh, you know, your work is focused on teaching coaches, teaching leaders to communicate this way. Uh, 
you know, today in America, one in two workers are a $400 parking ticket away from poverty. Uh, we, uh, 80% are service sector. You know, we're living in a time where for three decades, uh, wage growth has not gone up. It seems to be more and more people who are paid the least pay the most inside of communities. Uh, what, if you were speaking to the frontline worker who maybe is a back of house uh, person who is trying to elevate themselves up in the workforce, uh, how can they use the tools and techniques from motivational interviewing to affect their colleagues, their organization, maybe their own professional and personal growth? Uh, I mean, it's a profound question in the sense that um, I think you're speaking to really systemic problems in our world, in our economy. Um, I, I think in two ways. One, what motivational interviewing really points to is the power of internal motivation. And having worked in various times in my career with people that were struggling, um, I can say that those those people who were able to pull through and overcome the kind of obstacles you're talking about are the ones that were more aware of and with their own life made more present what their internal values are. And so I think there is a part of this is about communicating, but there's also like a individual part of motivational interviewing, which is to say, if you're really struggling, what, what helps people to stay motivated and, and connected is having a real sense of why they're doing something, you know, um, you know, I think it was Goethe who said, he who has a why can bear any, almost any how. And so what I've seen with athletes um, who were, you know, struggling to make it or people who were struggling to make it, you know, check to check or those people that had a clear defined sense of why they were doing things and what their personal values were, were able to really overcome those obstacles with greater regularity. The other thing I would say is, you know, like what, what, it doesn't matter where you are on a team. This is important for leaders, but it's also important for the person who is, you know, say um, really layered and has a lot of people above them in an organization. The, the people that are, 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 if you think about who gets promoted, right? And who makes it through an organization, there's certainly, I would say a fundamental aspect of that. That's like, what is your talent? What is your ability? What are your raw abilities to contribute? Right. So like as a baseball player, do you have the skills to do you, are, are your five tools good as a football player? Um, what's your speed? All these things as a as a corporate athlete, if you will, you know, what's your ability to assess, make good decisions, um, have good strategy and, you know, good technical ability. That said, so many choices and forward migration in in and success in these different industries has to do with personal relationships, has to do with connection. And I don't mean like, you know, oh, you know, you know someone. I'm just talking about just having a deeper relationship with people. And so I think when you're someone who's trying to, you know, overcome barriers to make it through a system, you know, focusing on deepening your relationships is just really good insurance um, for being able to maximize your opportunities. John, we're talking about future of work. I can have one more question for you. Yeah. Uh, what's your hope for the future of work? I think my my hope for the future of work um, is that people um, that that the work that we are doing in high performing organizations um, seeps into all kinds of organizations. Um, in the elite uh, firefighting and military and sports settings I've worked in, there's been more and more emphasis on human factors, right? So, um, you know, the idea of like, you don't have to be sick to get better, right? That even, you know, groups that have are really traditional um, military settings, the Navy SEALs, uh, the New York City Fire Department, um, you know, elite sports settings have started to really focus on um, the the third dimension um, of of mental fitness and conditioning. And so, my hope is that you know every organization begins to think about really practical ways 
that they can train their workforce on mental fitness. And so that, that could look like, you know what, we're going to train everybody on motivational interviewing to improve the way people communicate. It could look like we're going to do mindfulness as part of our group. Um, we're going to, you know, get a like one huddle does have a pool table in the middle of the conference room, but like just really think about, all right, we're going to address um, the human aspect of this. And so I think that that's happening to some extent, but, you know, I think it used to be looked at as like an add on. Oh, OK, we're going to pay attention to this, but that's sort of just like a perk versus the main line. This is the gas, you know, um, if, if if humans are happy, then the employees are happy. And as we say in, in our book, Coaching Athletes to Be Their Best, it's human first, athlete second. And so it's really human first, manager second, human first, leader second. And so I, my hope is that there's more focus on on developing human mental and physical health as part of the workplace and not just something that's a, a sideline, you know, kind of uh, side dish. Jonathan, really appreciate you taking the time to share. My pleasure. It's really, hey, Sam, the, the questions you ask are so central to what it means to being a productive, happy person in a work environment. And, and uh, I love this podcast and love what you're doing. Thank you. One of the other things I talked to Jonathan after the podcast wasn't in the recording, and I asked him a little bit about this because it's in his book, uh, which I'm sure you're going to pick up and, and check out. He talks about how purposeful practice is an important part of the development process. He says, in more than a decade of coaching elite performers, I've seen what it takes to commit to purposeful practice. I liken this type of practice to turning up the brightness on your cell phone display when we fully commit to practice and give our attention to living life as sport. Everything is brighter, crisper, and more colorful. And we talked a little bit about this because at the end of the day, the organizational challenge that everybody's facing as they think about the future of work is how they create an environment where everyone on their team can bring their best self to work. And it starts with practice and how you develop practice. And I think that's why also a lot of the points that I wrote down from the conversation with Jonathan, um, you know, are come back to this concept of, you know, how do we make sure that practice is effective? And we talked about the power of internal motivation, talking about how the ones pull through are more aware of their internal values. It makes me think about how uh, to develop a high performing practice environment. Uh, all of our people have to understand uh, not just what our values are as an organization, but also their own internal values. So how many organizations out there are helping their people better identify the values that they subscribe to every day? He talked about you don't have to be sick to get better, which pulling it back to practice means that just because you learned something two years ago doesn't mean you don't need to know it again. Organizations that are high performing are constantly coming back to the fundamentals. You know, when I played football, we started every practice with a tackling circuit. You know, you, and if you watch NFL teams in practice and friends I have that coach at the NFL levels, they do tackling drills in practice. These guys are elite performers. You think they know how to tackle? Of course they do. Why are they working on it? Because you can always get better at it. So this concept of you don't have to be sick to get better, I think is really powerful from Jonathan. He also made the comment around feedback and how while it's a very powerful motion, some organizations have lost sight of how to do it effectively. I think it's an important thing to consider and reflect on uh, within your organization on, is there a, a model of feedback that, that you subscribe to? How is it working? What are things you could do better? What are the things you, could, you should stop doing? Uh, but the idea of feedback being something that, while important, is something that organizations maybe not be excelling at today is also a, a very powerful observation from Jonathan. I'll close on my final takeaway. Human first, manager second. Organizations have a responsibility to develop better people, not employees, not workers, and for the love of everything else, not learners, which I mean is something I hear people say all the time. How are my learners doing? Um, it's scary. Human first, manager second. It's just better overall. So if you haven't already, head on over to your local bookstore, pick up Life as Sport, What Top Athletes Can Teach You About How to Win in Life by Dr. Jonathan Fader. Thanks again to Jonathan Fader for joining us for this podcast. Now don't forget to subscribe to Bring It In so you never miss an episode. We've got some awesome guests lined up that you're not going to want to miss. Now, back to work. Back to work.